Yeah, I run an educational a consultancy called Nature's Work, and I run workshops and training events in the UK and uh, in the Alps, really looking at widening environmental knowledge. Um, and this presentation is really an introduction to alpine flowers and ecology, uh, and it will be available afterwards. So there's a couple of links on there that you might want to um, follow. If you don't write it down, then we'll, we'll have those links available. Um, and as I said, a couple of quizzes during it. So um, what it's really going to cover um, to give you confidence in identifying flowers, developing observational skills. It's very hard because we're online now um, to do this. It's easier when we're in the field, but um, there's still some things we can pick up to increase some knowledge of alpine ecology to add to already what you know. And then maybe to look at ways you can wow your clients with what you know and come across as being that alpine guru, um, alpine flower guru. So where do we start? You know, what is an alpine flower? Um, and they're really flowers that are able to live and survive above and beyond what is a natural tree line. You can see that image there. There's coniferous forests in the Alps. Um, and then there's a, there's a kind of level, a point uh, at which trees, the ability to survive, um, they just kind of lose that ability. And yet these tiny ground hugging flowers can then survive on another 1, 1,500 meters of altitude beyond that tree line. So it's an interesting phenomenon. We're not going to dwell on that too much today. But I mean, I love alpine flowers and they're really special. They're incredibly diverse, phenomenal variety, and almost all flower groups are represented in the Alps or in, in the world's mountains. Um, they're able to survive this harsh environment. They can grow in this extreme climate. Uh, there's extreme temperature, strong sunlight, exposure to the drying, damaging effects of strong winds. And yet they can reproduce in what is a very short alpine summer. And maybe not everyone appreciates that they've come from all over the world. So there are some that have come from North America, Scandinavia, Asia, and kind of North Africa and the Mediterranean basin. So they've all got a different origin. Some are, have evolved in the Alps, but a lot of them have traveled over these geographic regions to get to where they are today. Some interesting phenomenon that occur with alpine flowers is that um, this process called convergent evolution where plants that come from very different origins under uh, various selective pressures of the environment look very similar. So King of the Alps and alpine rock jasmine are very, very different in terms of their flower families. King of the Alps is closely related to borage and the rock jasmines are in the primrose family and yet living high in the mountains they've adapted genetically and morphologically to grow in a similar pattern and to have a similar shape. Other things that are really interesting about alpine flowers is they're all tiny there's this nanism they're very small here's an example of one very, very close up to flowered saxifrage. And it's another characteristic, their diminutive size. Being small, uh, they can um, absorb ground heat, they can avoid drying winds, they get protection from overlying snow. Whereas the trees, which we have to reproduce in the air, uh, where it's windier and more exposed, is possibly one of the limits of why they can't survive to a higher level, but the ground hugging plants do survive at that higher level. So that's maybe a, one of the theories as to limiting the alpine um, tree line. A lot of them have very large roots. Some of them have a, up to a ratio of four to, so a ratio of roots to shoot length is four to one, which is incredible. Um, so the short it's a bellflower there, its roots spread out about 70 centimeters and a plant that size could have a, a root mass of about four and a half meters. Um, grasses can have roots that travel three, three meters or so, but you're in an alpine environment and the soils are very thin, uh, they're mobile environments and anchorage is really important. Um, being able to kind of eke out like meager, meager uh, kind of water and minerals and things. It's, and also ability to um, 
it offers great stability in these mobile environments as well. So, you know, lots of reasons why um, there's a phenomenon, which is just this big root system that, that alpine flowers have developed, um, which is not exclusive to them, but it's a very, very common trait. Um, yeah, so the, oh, and the fact the bellflower has got an eight and a half meter length of roots, so not four and a half, so actually eight and a half meters. So a plant like that on the, on the right has got a huge root structure. Another plant, classic plant here, moss campion, uh, a classic cushion plant has deep tap root, which is fairly common to all campions. So you get a sea campion and red campion in the hedges and things. Um, and this diagram here illustrates the kind of that big tap root and then that extensive network of, of uh, roots that spread out there. Um, so it's much larger than what you see above. So the plants extend, you know, greater underground. Another aspect of alpine ecology is plants live a long life. Um, there's incredibly few uh, annuals, uh, like a lot of your garden flowers that you might like, where you put in your window boxes, that live for a year, maybe two years. Um, there are no alpine flowers in the Arctic, but there's only one or two in the Alps. So things like snow gentian is a is a, one that you may come across in the Alps, which is a an annual. Um, Forget me nots are biennials, and so on. But there's very very few. So the secret to living in the Alps is like a long life. Um, if you think about the environment and how extreme it is, you've got maybe six to 12 weeks to grow, to set seed, and uh, to do all of your function within that very, very short period of time. So three months is nothing uh, for a growing season, whereas in the lowlands, that growing season might be up to eight or nine months. So the chances of getting that right in, in that extreme environment are very, very low. Um, So there's the idea of a long life is also given in some of the names. So like the house leeks, Sempervivum, Sempervivum uh, means always alive in its original name. So, uh, so yeah, they're perennials. They live a very, very long life. You've got live long saxophrase as well. So there, the kind of name is, is, is inherent there. Um, and if we went back to the, Moss Campion, I'll just run back there. That flower there, I took that photo last summer, it's probably about half a meter wide and it's around a hundred years old. So there have been some to be known in the Alps, in the Italian Alps that are about six foot wide that are over about 300 years old. So that tiny little plant there is, has an incredible age. It grows about four or five millimeters per year. It grows out, um, so yeah. They're really fascinating. Um, when we look at what life we find in all the flowers, we find a whole variety. We don't find many short-lived flowers, but we find these perennial flowers. And some of them are herbs, which are non-woody. So plants like alpine, columbine, and grasses, they're all perennial herbs. They live for many, many years, um, but they're non-woody. We then also have these dwarf shrubs. So you've got bearberry, you've got woody stems, you've got dwarf alpine rose there, limestone loving flower. And so they're long lived and they set down wood. Um, cushion flowers are all, are all um, dwarf shrubs as well. Other life forms that you will come across are things called the cryptogams. These are the, the spore bearing plants and it, basically cryptogam means a hidden reproduction so we get lichens we get ferns mosses club mosses and they've been around far longer than any of the flowering plants and coniferous plants um, they withstand the extremes of the alpine environment far better than any seed bearing plant so they're the true alpine experts if we look at how alpine flowers reproduce We've got sexual reproduction. Um, if you think about what, re what reproduction is, it's the aim of pretty much all living organisms is to reproduce. Sexual reproduction offers genetic variability. 
uh, allowing species to adapt to kind of new environmental conditions if they change. So it gives them an evolutionary advantage through natural selection. There's lots of pollinators in the mountains, but the environment's so extreme and the flowers are probably not so closely living that the numbers of, of pollinators is lower in the mountains. Um, Other aspects of sexual reproduction are these great large flowers that you find. It's a huge cost in energy to, to grow the flowers, but there's a great benefit for the flowers to actually have these great kind of parabolic shapes um, that outweigh the cost of producing them. Um, and it also shows the importance of pollination in the mountain flowers. Um, so yeah, there's lots of pollen, lots of ovules, lots of lots of flowers there within that. So there's a, a great heavy reliance upon that genetic diversity. Um, also, that shape is there's a phenomenon known uh, heliotropism. So it's a, a kind of sun tracking that a lot of these alpine flowers do, and it must somehow focus and concentrate the sun's energy um, to help seed development and seed growth and so on. There's also the wind pollinated plants as well. So sexual reproduction is really, really common, but also non-sexual reproduction is uh, kind of risky for the long-term survival, um, but plants grow by um, asexually by cloning or by producing baby fragments. Um, so, Asexual reproduction is costly in terms of energy. Asexual reproduction is often uh, a good alternative form and is very prevalent in the Alps and in high mountains. Um, some plants, for instance, mountain sorrel, when it's in low level, will produce sexually, but when it's high in the mountains, it will reproduce asexually. So you get some variations that occur within flowers as well. So this is a really interesting. Um, variations that happen within a species as well as between species. So in terms of clonal growth you'll see tussocks. So these produce baby little plantlets from their rootstock producing these tussocks um, and these the kind of fragments all hold together rather than forming a lawn or a meadow they form these big tussocks which you'll find all over um, lowland areas as well as upland areas but they're but they're it's a growth form. You also can get underground uh, runners or uh, stems produced by the parent plant. So you can see on that cotton grass there, you can't see the overground runner, but on the ground you get these things called stolons. So they're connected still to the parent. Um, the parent may die and that young plant can survive. So a plant, one of these kind of asexual reproduction, it might last for, some plants can be over a thousand years old, but no individual might be over 20 or 30 years. So it's a really interesting form of um, a kind of survival. You get plants which are produce rhizomes and modified stems which live on the ground and they produce roots and shoots. Um, a classic example is root ginger. So if you think about growing root ginger from that big root, you get little suckers or, or shoots appearing. So that's an example of a rhizome and mountain everlasting there is is an example. Uh, you get lots of these in mobile screes as well, so they've got a kind of elastic uh, and long rhizomes that can just keep producing shoots like, like mountain everlasting. Plants that form tufts, a bit similar to tussocks, but tussocks generally grasses and, and you get tufts like Mount Senis bellflower there, um, which produce these small clumps or, or tufts. And then you get the ones which produce a mat. So alpine willow herb. And there's an example of how the plants are connected to each other and then they root. So that's an overground map. So they're perfect colonizers of, of, of bare ground. Another form of asexual reproduction is giving birth to live young. So alpine bistor, as you can see on uh, just here, there's a baby bulb been produced. So these are the flowers, which do work at low elevations, but at high elevations, they rely solely on producing these baby little bulbils or these baby plants. So they produce it without pollination. Um, so it's, 
a fantastic adaptation to ba produce a little baby plant. Um, uh, plants like Alpine meadow grass, you can see on the plant there, I'll put this little pointer up, you can see little baby plants being formed there with the leaves and those are going to fall to the ground with roots and just fall to the ground and just have done all their germination on the plant as well. So they're, um, they've given birth to a live young. So it's really interesting how these kind of forms occur in the mountains. There's this really clever thing as well called apomixic. Um, so Alpine Ladies Mantle does this and it can only reproduce by this means where it, it kind of mimics sexual reproduction and produces seed but without pollination. Um, Mountain Everlasting does it as well. As do brambles and hawthorn and rowan trees, dandelions do this, but not exclusively. So Alpine Ladies of Mantle will only reproduce. It's a form of clonal growth, but giving birth, its sexual reproduction is mimicked by this seed development without fertilization. So they're exact clones of the parent, um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't me maybe necessarily lead to a good adaptation to uh, climate change or environmental conditions that change. So moving swiftly on, if we look at some of the adaptations to survival, um, short growing season, um, some plants, especially snowbed plants, have this adaptation, this alpine snowbell, produces and forms its um, bud in the autumn or at the end of the summer, whereas normally you produce that and ge that germinates in the spring like a lot of flowers have just been doing now. These are ready to go at the end of the summer so that when they're covered by snow, they start feeling the heat and the, and the spring melt and they'll push up through and they'll help that metabolic activity helps to melt the snow and they emerge ready formed and ready to go. So preformed buds are a good adaptation of snowbed species. Being hairy is Edelweiss. You can even see the hairy um, flowers within that. So it's a very, very hairy plant itself. So it's good for uh, insulation, not just on the leaves and the stem, but um, around the, the flowers itself. So it produces insulation and gives an advantage in a cold climate. Fleshy leaves, so good thick fleshy leaves, um, good resistance to uh, cold damage and water loss. We've talked about cushing forming plants a little bit earlier with moss campion. Here they kind of hug the, the little rock crevices and they avoid the drying winds and they clonal growths and they, they just grow but they, they kind of avoid, they eke out the meagre kind of nutrients that are in those rock crevices um, but they just avoid those drying winds so they can live on phenomenally exposed areas like that rock jasmine there. Then you get frost tolerant. So you got extreme climate, it's warm, it's cold. Uh, day temperature in the summer is really warm, cold. There's frost tolerance and normally plants harden up. But um, some plants, well, all plants really need to be above freezing point, above zero degrees to um, photosynthesize, to grow, lay, lay down new, new growth and what have you and, and material. But there are some species like um, Glacier crowfoot there, which have this ability to do all that to a low temperature of minus six, which is normally cells would freeze. But what they've done is converted starch to which is insoluble to sugars, and so which are soluble, and that can help free up all the metabolic kind of um, mechanism within the cells, so it can still function at a very cold temperature. So like we can we we salt roads in the winter that has the same kind of effect there where they can function this allows kind of a super cooling so really interesting adaptations and then you get plants succulents um so they store water uh they reduce uh water loss and um hot dry days and um, they're able to survive on these very barren areas which you'd expect from kind of deserts really um, but 
high mountains, you also get these very, very dry areas, although there's higher rainfall, it's, um, drought tolerance is a, is a good adaptation to living in the mountain. So I'm going to jump now to Kahu. Can you see that, Helen? Yeah, yeah, it's there. Great. Excellent. So how would you, how could you become a flower or ninja flower identifier? So look at the flower shape, you look at the leaf shape, look at the habitat. Um, you can also look at where they are in terms of altitude. So there's lots of books available for this. Some of them are organized by family, others are organized by color. And there's one that came out in the autumn, which is a user-friendly guide. Um, within that book, um, myself and a colleague, Paul Gannon wrote, um, you can look at the flower structure. So it's, it's often the thing that people find difficult about learning about these flowers is where to begin. Um, but the descriptions, looking at pages like that, which has popped up, is, are really important because it gives you an idea of what the leaf margin is like or what type of flower shape. Is it a radial pattern of symmetry or is it like a book page where it's bilateral symmetry and so on? So that can often lead you to knowing it would either be this flower or that flower. So this section is really looking at, at that. Um, Within that guide, I would, I've devised it so it's related by flower colour and then by um, like the, the flower morphology, so the shape of the flower. So you, it's an easier guide to follow than say a, a proper key where you've got to really know which family it belongs to. Um, so is that thing, is that covering the top of... Um, so we're just going to go through four different families. The pea family, there's 13,000 known species. Some of them are important food crops like chickpeas, alfalfa, lentils, and so on, peas themselves. So what characteristics? If you see a flower which has got that shape, which is like a book shape, which is folded in the middle, so it's a bilateral mirror image, you've got certain characteristics on um, a pea family. You've got these, these three component part so there's a an example of that flower um, in a milk vetch I think it is um, but all peas have nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots so acacia trees in 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 the tropics are in the pea family gorse bushes are in the pea family and they can all fix nitrogen which gives them an advantage where there's very little nitrogen in the soil and they do it with a little bacteria that lives in these nodules and it breaks up, it takes atmospheric nitrogen, it, it makes nitrates for the, the plant to feed. So it's really, 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 really important in low nutrient environments. Another characteristic, they've got those kind of regular leaf patterns or this regular branching, a pinnate or a divided leaf. And they will also produce seed pods, some black, some hairy, um, they'll all crack open, leave the seeds, gorse, it's, fire helps with that distribution and so they're good advantage in, in you know, those natural fires that you might get. So, um, and acacia you get these great big pods in, in the tropics as well, so that's, they're all characteristics of the pea family. If we have a look at the rose family, um, two and a half thousand known species around the world, a lots of edible fruits, apples, peaches, and cherries all belong to this family. So what are the characteristics? Well, there's a pattern of symmetry, this radial pattern. So it's glacier sank foil there. So you've got that, that's a very diminutive form there. Um, berries, a lot of them are edible. So there's a strawberry. So those apples, you think about that. So if you've got five petals, it's that kind of symmetry. Or if you've got a berry, it may be it well belong to that family. If you look at the, the rose hit there, characteristics, you've got jaggedy edged leaves and you've got thorns. So they're characteristics, general characteristics, not always on everyone, but they're general characteristics of that family. So if you think about the brambles that are coming to flower now, count the petals. Daisy, it's probably the biggest family in the world. It's really complicated, but it's not in some ways, 
a flower may have these rays that protrude outwards and they have little discs in the middle and they're all baby flowers so it's a composite of maybe 100 150 flowers within one head so it's a that's why they they call a, a composite flower head but each one of those if you think about a sunflower will produce a little seed so each flower can produce a seed as a baby plant um, that's the composite flower head some of them produce have that central disc and all those rays other ones just have the rays some of them just have discs it's a massive family dandelions it doesn't have the rays and the discs if you have a look at the dandelion tomorrow they're all out have a look see what see what bit of that flower is really dominant they've also got simple or spiny or lobe leaf so there's uh thistles there so huge flowers look at that flower head and think about what types of flowers they've got so the description um, when you look at that will all be characteristic of that family and then finally we just have a look at the orchid family this probably the second most the second most diverse family in the world it's certainly the most developed evolutionary which is why if you look in some books it's always at the back because evolutionary flowers start really with like buttercups and they go all the way through the flowers and evolutionary orchids are the most developed um, they have large fragrant flowers they have pods they have this bilateral symmetry beautiful adaptations to insect um, attracting insects they have three sepals they have three petals so unusual number really if you think about five or some plants have six but these are, are three petals and they're really colorful the sepals are basically the bits that protect the, the petals of the flower but they can be as beautiful if you think of like the ladies slipper orchid there those dark brown sepals there are a really important part they're parallel veins in the leaves and you get seed pods so uh, vanilla I think is the only edible orchid the only edible part of any orchid in the world and it's a creeping plant um, that climbs up like a vine really um, produce these beautiful seed pods that dry out I was gonna give you a little quiz now so how do you wow your clients so you're doing a great job leading them you need to find stories to engage them and my thinking is from the, the point of view from the flowers so we're engaging them we're trying to involve them with their activities we want to develop an inquiry or question and, and and just kind of engage them with the natural world so um say you had some resources say you had some little cards which had information on little facts some information about their families or where their their size or the elevation they're found or the months they're flowering in or you know you get a variety of these little little cards or you might have a, a top trump activity where you've got facts and you've got information about the maximum altitude of that or the, the bigger the flower size and so on so there's there's things so you had some resources what games or activities could you play with them now last week i ran a little competition on my website uh, through facebook to Get people to come up with ideas so you could win a pack of these and ideas that came up was like you stick a card in your head it's like guess who i am heads up or blind man's bluff or idiot poker it's called it's got lots of different names but you can everyone knows the, the answer but you pelmanism is like a matching pairs it's um you probably played this where you got to turn that over and you got to find the pair if you you know just ideas that you can come up with involving engaging a group you come up with snap you can look at it with flower families or flower color for instance and you issue the cards out these activities like that grouping activity find someone with that or you can do poker hands you can come up with a full house and you can trade off cards and and try and get four of a kind four colors or um plants of the same family there's all sorts of things you can do it's it's it was really amazing to see what people came up with some of these ideas i put them on their worksheet and it's on my website which you'll be glad to know you can get for free. Um, I do sell cards. Uh, some of them are available. Top Trump sets are available, but the playing cards I've, I'm having an issue at the moment because the um, 
the card manufacturer has had to close because of they couldn't protect their staff so they closed last week so i didn't quite get my flowers uh, my flower cards produced um so there's a waiting list for them um but please email me uh, and if you'd like if you're interested in those the final thing i've got to say because it's quarter past seven now just like a bit of feedback so if you wouldn't mind going online you can click the qr code um, or type in on your phone menti.com and you'll be asked to enter a code and that code is just up on the top of the screen there it's 892779 and you'll be asked to just um, answer three uh, uh, questions there's three slides there so um, your thoughts on uh, what words describe your experience with this workshop. So um, just enter your, your words there on your phone and then you can go to the next. If anyone's having an issue with that, let me know or not. I don't know if that, there we go. Encouraging, enter. fascinating, great, it is working. <laughs> I can produce this word cloud at the end and we can share it. Um, Kahoot was great. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it's good fun. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much for those. And then just on this slider, um, how useful did you think the workshop was? The quality of it? Uh, was it inspiring, interesting? What did you rate the interactive quizzes? It's going to be about 30 pages apart. Fantastic. And I don't know if you can forward to the next one anyway, but um, yeah, further workshops would be a benefit. More like this. A fantastic teacher, thank you. More flowers and geology. Definitely more environmental knowledge, geology. We can link flowers with geology as well, or we could just get geology. Geology is popular. Geology is popular. We know someone who uh, might fulfill that. We know somebody, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tree identification. Geology and tree ID. Brilliant. Seems like it was useful and worthwhile to get. I'll share my, well, I'll, I'll share the results from this uh, Mentimeter later, but I'm gonna shoot off, if that's all right. So any questions, feel, you know, feel free to um, either email or um, through Helen, then um, I can answer anything. I've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's some time on your hand.